Thank you to Rotary. Thank you to the public. Uh, we're here for a special interview with a special individual on a special topic. David Crane was the founding prosecutor of the Sierra Leone Tribunal. The Sierra Leone Tribunal was created by the United Nations, and David was selected by Secretary General Kofi Annan to be the chief prosecutor and to be the first American chief prosecutor of an international war crimes tribunal since a guy named Robert H. Jackson. So in the uh, genealogy of American chief prosecutors, you got Robert H. Jackson, you have David M. Crane, and we're so therefore thrilled to have him here. Uh, his legacy is long. And among those is the fact on the Sierra Leone Tribunal, he was responsible for the indictment of Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor, the first head of state to be indicted and subsequently convicted of war crimes since Nuremberg. So you kind of get this drift where David Crane is not only the Jackson legacy, the indictment, head of state, Nuremberg, Jackson, uh, it's, it's all connected. And for all those reasons, and you'll hear many more in our interview, uh, which certainly will not do justice at all, no pun intended, for uh, what all David has uh, meant to international criminal jurisprudence. But we're thrilled that everybody could join us. We're thank you, Marika Lampard and Becky Robbins, for inviting us to participate today uh, in this special presentation. So, without any further ado, I'm going to pause and show a brief four-minute piece, which will help put David Crane into perspective. This is the opening statement of the Sierra Leone Tribunal. This is the trial chamber, the special court of Sierra Leone, held in Freetown. Courthouse number one on Thursday, 3rd June 2004. May it please this chamber, Your Honors, on this solemn occasion, mankind is once again assembled before an international tribunal to begin the sober and steady climb upwards toward the towering summit of justice. The path will be strewn with the bones of the dead, the moans of the mutilated, the cries of agony of the tortured echoing down into the valley of death below. Horrors beyond the imagination will slide into this hallowed hall as this trek upward comes to a most certain and just conclusion. The long dark shadows of war are retreating. The pain, agony, the destruction, and the uncertainty are fading. The light of truth, the fresh breeze of justice moves freely about this beaten and broken land. The rule of law marches out of the camps of the downtrodden onward under the banners of never again and no more. President George W. Bush, in May of 2001, signed a second of two executive orders. The government of Liberia's complicity in the RUF's illicit trade in diamonds and its other forms of support for the RUF are direct challenges to the United States foreign policy objectives in the region as well as the rule-based international order that is critical to the peace and prosperity of the United States. Therefore, I find these actions by the government of Liberia contribute to the unusual and extraordinary threat to the foreign policy of the United States described in Executive Order 13194, with respect to which the President declared a national emergency. What followed was a dispatch of the attack pack led by Lieutenant Colonel David Crane, Defense Intelligence 30 years prosecutor. He, Crane, unlawfully unsealed the court's 
sealed indictment to his handlers. Senior U.S. government officials at the U.S. Embassy in Freetown and was never held to account. James C. Johnson, U.S. Army expert, 20 years on conventional and special operations, chief of prosecutions for the SCSL. Mr. Taylor, for the foregoing reasons, the trial chamber unanimously sentences you to a single term of imprisonment of 50 years for all of the counts on which you've been found guilty. Thank you. You can be seated, Mr. Taylor. Well, it's interesting. Uh, as you know, we uh, every year here in uh, the Jamestown area, I invite all of my colleagues, the current and former chief prosecutors of all the world's international tribunals, to assemble at uh, the Chautauqua Institution for the International Humanitarian Law Dialogues, many of which I see in the audience have attended. Uh, the ninth dialogue, uh, back in uh, 2016, we were sitting around the porch of the Athenaeum Hotel. Uh, uh, my colleagues, there were about eight chief prosecutors, including myself, and I asked this rhetorical question. You know, we're all good friends, and so we're sipping a glass of wine or a glass of beer, and I said, uh, did any one of you ever ask to be a chief prosecutor of an international tribunal? And uh, we all kind of looked at me, and we kind of all went around the table, so to speak, and uh, none of us ever sought out, uh, applied for uh, positions that we got. But we, also, but we did get what we call the phone call. Uh, from somewhere out of the blue, I have my own story about that. Maybe we can talk about it later. And uh, it was amazing to me. And I thought about that as I was flying back to my home in Maggie Valley, North Carolina, uh, just at the gateway of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, where I currently live. And I thought, you know, I, I realized that no chief prosecutor has ever written a book about what they did, to include Robert Jackson. There's people written about what they did, but they actually never put pen to paper. So I said, my goodness, well, there are five people in the world since Nuremberg, Robert Jackson, myself, Luis Marino Ocampo, Robert Petit, and Richard Goldstone, who have actually not only got the phone call, but were also asked to, f to find, found, create a tribunal. So I called my other three colleagues. Of course, Robert Jackson has passed on. Uh, but I said, would you be interested in writing a chapter about the phone call that you got, as well as then what you did afterwards over the next year? Your personal reflections, your, uh, your personal point of view as to what it took for you and your family personally to do this. Uh, much to my surprise, they all readily agreed. Of course, that's just the heart of the book, but then, of course, for those of you who are not scholars in this area, I wanted to have contextual chapters put in to explain why any of this is important, uh, which I did, and I, I, I brought on some of the best and brightest experts uh, in uh, international criminal law to do explain all of this in a context. Because uh, Kofi Annan was actually the Secretary General of the United Nations throughout the entire creation of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, for Yugoslavia, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, and the International Criminal Court, that's our permanent criminal tribunal now, uh, I invited him, he doesn't write very much, uh, he just, that's not his style, I invited him to, to uh, write the foreword to the book, and much to my surprise, he readily agreed. So Kofi Annan also wrote the foreword. And so that's uh, how the book came to pass. We all met a few months later at Nuremberg during the 10th IHL Dialogues and the 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg Judgments where all the authors sat around, and we all agreed to the format of the book. This was September of 2016. and. Uh, Last week, uh, Cambridge University Press, the world's oldest academic press, uh, released the book. And uh, so uh, the Founders is sitting on the podium there. Uh, much to my surprise, we were supposed to have lots of copies, but the book sold out within a week. And uh, so there are no copies of the book available right now. I apologize. Yeah, it's kind of a good thing from my point of view, but from your point of view, I have to be very careful. I bought a few. I, you know, they send the authors copies. I only got like half of what I was allowed to have because there weren't any left. 
So, uh, but they'll be coming, and you can get it on, actually, you can get it on Amazon Prime. Uh, I don't know where they got their copies, but my two kids got their copies today, actually. That just is a coincidence. But uh, so much for trying to sell the book, I don't think that's necessary. But again, uh, it's an historic piece of work because it's the first and only time that you'll have not only one chief prosecutor talk about what they did, but all the prosecutors that created the tribunals. And we have a wonderful chapter written by Dean Michael Scharf of Case Western Reserve uh, School of Law. I asked him, he's also one of the editors of the book, but I asked him to write a piece about Nuremberg from Robert Jackson's point of view and kind of place himself in Robert Jackson's as if he was Robert Jackson was writing that chapter. And, um, and Michael did a wonderful job there. So uh, I hope that you, if you do decide to get it, that you'll find it's important and, and useful uh, to uh, your perspective on the fact, that despite all of the clutter and the kaleidoscopic world that we live in, it is still the rule of law that allows uh, mankind to move forward uh, with humanity and keep a more just and secure world. So David, you uh, graduated with your get a Bachelor of Science from Ohio University, you get your JD from Syracuse University. Mm -hmm. uh, and a little piece of uh, the story is, didn't your dad go to law school as well? Or did your dad go to Syracuse? My father-in-law went to Syracuse well, University, uh, class of 1943. Wasn't there a Jackson Connect there? Uh, yeah, uh, actually he received his diploma from Robert Jackson uh, at Syracuse University. So it's, there's kind of a circular aspect to my life with Robert Jackson in places that I never expected. So uh, he took it, that diploma from uh, the great man and walked off the stage the next, next step was hitting the beach at Normandy and walked across Europe and bumped into the Soviet Union in Austria. And next thing he uh, had a daughter, next thing the daughter marries you, and uh, next thing after 30 years in government service, you get a call. What was the call like? Well, one is I want to pay credit to, uh, to my wife who served her country for 25 years with the Defense Intelligence Agency and uh, in the quiet shadows of the intelligence business. and. Uh, so I, she's as much a hero in my mind, because you know I, I went all the glory and she still had to keep the house and the home fires burning when I left for three years to West Africa. And it was very much like World War II. I left. Uh, and uh, so uh, all credit to her. But uh, the famous phone call was August 27th, uh, 2001. And uh, my wife and I both working, uh, I was uh, uh, in, uh, Inspector General, Department of Defense, and busy. You know how things are in Washington. For those of you who lived in Washington, everybody gets up and goes to work at 6 and doesn't come home till 7. That's de rigor. And we were just sitting down. All our kids were off and grown already. And so a rare opportunity of a, of a spaghetti dinner. I was just uncorking the Chianti, and Judy was fluffing the noodles, and a phone rings. Of course, in those days, if you remember 2002, that was usually the time on the credit card. Remember? And, so I'm grousing and walk up and, hello. And uh, Mr. Crane, who is this? <coughs> well, this is, uh, this is Richard Haas from the National Security Council. And uh, can I, you got a couple minutes? And I said, sure. And uh, I'm thinking, what in the heck? And he said, I just want to ask, because we're starting this process, would you be interested in being the American nominee to be the chief prosecutor of the new international tribunal in West Africa. And I thought about a nanosecond and said, sure, I'd be interested. And uh, flippantly, actually. And uh, he says, well, great. That's all I need to know for right now. More to follow. Thank you very much. Click. So Judy is setting the table. And I see, she goes, who was that? And I told her. And she just started laughing. She goes, you're not going to get that. You're American. And uh, I said, yeah, you're right. Because you know, at this time, John Bolton had just pulled, signed the Bolton letter and pulled the United States out of the International Criminal Court. Uh, and so the whole world was mad at us at the beginning of being mad at us. And I, I thought there's no political way that they're going to take an American. And then she started laughing. She goes, you know, because this is a Republican White House. She goes, and you're a Democrat. And I said, I know. So we both kind of sat down, and then, by the way, the spaghetti was great and the county was even better. 
I, I forgot about it because two weeks later, uh, three planes went into the building, uh, one of which we were in uh, at the Pentagon. And we were at war, and I promptly forgot everything other than just to start doing the things that we had to do. Uh, about three weeks after 9-11, I get a call from the State Department, uh, the War Crimes Office, saying, uh, uh, Mr. Crane, are you still interested in that position? I said, are you, are you serious about that? And he, uh, he kind of stuttered a little bit. I said, yes, sir. And uh, he said, could you send us your resume? We're getting ready to put the packet to go through the White House to the UN. I said, sure. So I told, told my secretary to shoot it over. And we had email then, brand new kind of thing, but we had email. And, and then, I, again, I just promptly forgot about it. And uh, then all of a sudden, things started happening. And on August, April 19th, I got a call from uh, the UN, Hans Corell, on behalf of Kofi Annan, asking whether I'd be interested in being the chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. And this is 11.30 in the morning. And he says, you, I need to know, because we're about to announce it at noon. And Reuters had, Reuters had broken the story that night before. And I'd heard rumblings that something was amiss because the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs called me about 10 saying, have you heard this? And he read this thing, American to be chief prosecutor of. And I said, no. And he goes, is that you? And I go, I'm not sure because no one's told me. So I'm, I called the State Department, the War Crimes Office, and they said, huh? They didn't know either, but you could hear somebody running down the hallway to go tell Colin Powell. Uh, and then the phone rang, and it was Hans Carell. I said yes. Uh, without calling my wife, I'm about to commit to three years of being gone. She knew this, though. I mean, she knew I had gone through a nomination process for six months, a tortuous process. Uh, so I told her after I accepted it, and, you know, she gulped, but uh, then the rest is history. But each prosecutor had these interesting stories. Richard Goldstone, Luis Marino Campo, Robert Petit, all of them, Fatou Ben Sauda, all of the, the, the colleagues and friends of mine that you see at the IHL Dialogues, we all got these, these phone calls out of the blue. We all had careers. We were all successful. Uh, we had every, had every reason to say no, because why would we, you know, we had secure futures, uh, uh, with, uh, and yet we dropped everything, retired, resigned, and started something that had every reason to fail. And, uh, but yet we, we did that, and hopefully the book will reflect that, that huge risk that we took of leaving families, ending careers, and stepping off into literary oblivion, and, and not even sure where this was all going. Hey, David, for the benefit of the, of the uh, audience, give a little background of why there was even a special tribunal for Sierra Leone created. What happened in Sierra Leone in the 90s, which would have precipitated this? Well, again, as the wall came down, remember the 1990s when uh, it looked like the world was literally going to balance itself out, uh, international peace and security, the United Nations won the Nobel Peace Prize, the Soviet Union was dissolving, democracy was burgeoning all across the country, the world was ready to buy the, a Coke, remember the song, I'd like to buy the world a Coke? It was heady times, if you remember them. I mean, it looked like, oh my God, and most of us are cold warriors. I've been fighting the Soviet Union since 1972, and so the fact that that uh, evil empire would dissolve in literally a month uh, was still being processed. Well, in you know, 1993, uh, we had a tragedy in, in the Balkans, and they created a, the world's first international war crimes tribunal. Richard Goldstone was the first since Nuremberg to be asked to do that, his phone call. Fascinating from Nelson Mandela. But the point is, is that uh, we see a resurgence of mankind saying, you know, we're going to hold accountable those heads of state to feed on their own citizens. You know, it's important to just digress here. The 20th century was the world's bloodiest 20, uh, 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 century. I call it the bloody 20th century. Over 225 million human beings died of non natural causes. Of those, 115 to 120, because I, I extrapolate my, my research, it could be off 25 percent, but over 115 million of them died at the hands of their own governments, mainly during the Cold War, making the Cold War the bloodiest war in history. More people died during the Cold War than World War II and World War I combined. So the world in this age of dictators was looking the other way with all these atrocities. When the wall came down, 
the United Nations and mankind have said, you know, we're not going to tolerate this anymore, and we created the modern international criminal law system, first being Yugoslavia, then Rwanda, then Sierra Leone, followed by the International Criminal Court, and then Cambodia. What took place in West Africa, really an unknown part of the world, uh, during the 1990s, uh, we have a very cynical individual named Muammar Gaddafi recruiting members of the good old boy clubs of Africa uh, to, uh, to work with him to, to make him the emperor of Africa. I'm not making this up. This is what he wanted to become. And so he was buying off all of the African heads of state so that he, they would support him in his quest to make Libya the cap, you know, Tripoli, the capital of Africa, and he would be the emperor of Africa. This is how he sold it. And not surprisingly, uh, you dangle five, ten million dollars in front of an African head of state, and he's your buddy and friend for the rest of your life. Uh, Taylor, uh, Charles, President Charles Taylor of Liberia, as well as uh, Blaise, President Blaise Campori of uh, Burkina Faso, all joined in with, with uh, Muammar Gaddafi to take over West Africa as a test bed. And they used diamonds as a way of helping to fund uh, the rebellion and they were going to take over all of West Africa, Burkina Faso, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, the Gambia. And this was all part of a plan. Why do we know that? It's because we had a, we turned an internal witness who basically told us all of this, this story. Uh, as a result, uh, Liberia and members of Liberia, uh, Libyan special forces, members of Burkina Faso, uh, various rebels from Sierra Leone invaded Sierra Leone in March of 1991 and began a reign of terror and combat that lasted almost 11 years, uh, the result of which uh, was the murder, rape, maiming, and mutilation of over 1.2 million human beings. Uh, uh, a forgotten part of the world. During this time frame, the world was looking to a better world, peace, the Soviet Union had fallen. So we were looking the other way. But at the end of the day, uh, they invaded Sierra Leone because Sierra Leone is one of the few places on earth that has what we call alluvial diamonds. They leach to the surface. You know, the, most of the diamonds, you've got to dig two miles down to get these gem quality diamonds where in Sierra Leone they leach to the surface and you dig five, ten feet and you're into gem quality diamonds. They wanted to, in, to occupy the eastern portion of Sierra Leone which has these diamond fields uh, and then hold those, begin using the diamonds to, uh, and I'll explain this in a minute, uh, to, to finance the rebellion and then they were going to take over the rest of Sierra Leone which they did. They immediately went to Kenema and, and the Kailahun district and, and seized the diamond fields. Now this is the blood diamond story, the one you've seen in the movies. It's a very tragic movie, but believe it or not, it's not even close to the horror that really took place. And so for years, uh, Charles Taylor and his henchmen, the RUF, the, uh, rounded up people from Sierra Leone, chained them to pits, and mine diamonds and work them to death, unlike seen since the work camps uh, in Europe in World War II. They would throw their bodies in, in this big, huge pit called Savage Waters, which would fill with rain uh, during the rainy season. Uh, so this was kind of the context with uh, when in uh, 2000, the president of Sierra Leone said, look, we have a tragedy here beyond description. Uh, I need help. And so the, the wheels began to turn uh, in the very slow moving aspect of, of the United Nations and uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 1351 in August of 2001 authorized the Secretary General. Because remember, the Secret Security Council is the operative arm of the United Nations. Secret Secretary General only administers the UN on behalf of the Security Council. So they directed the Sec Secretary General to uh, create a court, and they did, and then that's, you know, the context is how I got sucked into that. Uh, one of the things I learned as I was learning about West Africa was the, the incredible aspect of the diamond industry. Uh, did you know that diamonds are a common mineral? They are worth a 20th of what they're actually sold for. 
the diamond industry, a very kind of mysterious group of individuals, families, who have been controlling the diamond industry for a century, uh, pass diamonds around. They mine them. They're common. They put them in a large vault in London, $4.5 billion worth the last time I checked, and they raise the demand. Remember, if you love somebody, you're going to give them a what? As I tell my students at Syracuse, I go, you know, would just think this through. This, that seems kind of all right, so what? Well, if you came home up to your mother, ladies, and you said, I'm engaged, and you showed her a sapphire ring, what would your mother say? You don't love you that much. I'm being facetious, but the point is, is diamonds is our girl's best friend. They've marketed this thing to a point of where it's part of our culture now. Uh, most diamonds, gem quality diamonds, are sold in Canada, 70% the United States, then Canada and Japan. The rest of the world doesn't do this in large part. Uh, anyway, the demand is high, they put in the supply low, jacks up the price, and they just basically take this, this gravel, this pretty gravel, which is what it is, and slowly put it out, keeps the demand high. Uh, I was shocked. I didn't know that any more than you don't knew that until today. Uh, but I thought very seriously because, again, the diamond industry was very interested in what was going on in West Africa. I won't mention the company, but they have a wonderful commercial. Da -da -da -dum, da -da -da -dum. Sometime around the late January, you know, just a couple of weeks before February, uh, I thought seriously of indicting them for aiding and abetting war crimes and crimes against humanity. I didn't because I didn't have a case. You know, it's like tobacco litigation. You gotta, if you're going to take on the tobacco industry, you've got to have the right case, which they did, and they won. You can't lose when you take on an industry. And so I just didn't have it. There was no jurisprudence. The last time we even came close of indicting an, a, a company for aiding and abetting war crimes was the Krupp family in Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. And they were acquitted, or, you know, Jackson made a big mistake on indicting the younger son. And anyway, regardless, he was acquitted. So there was just no real precedent for this, so I chose not to. Someday, but not, not in my tribunal. So it's important for us to realize that, you know, minerals do play a part in these kind of tragedies. Uh, and also, other companies, such in Syria, in Yemen, and countries, aiding, abetting, selling arms to countries who are committing war crimes. For those of you who are lawyers, that sounds like aiding and abetting to me. If you knowingly know he's selling someone who is going to kill somebody, you sell him the gun knowing that he's going to murder somebody, I, as a prosecutor here in this county, would probably indict you for aiding and abetting a homicide. So, bigger scale, but the same thing. And so I now am involved, I'm involved in Syria, but I'm also now involved in Yemen as far as looking at cases against various countries who are aiding and abetting uh, the tragedy in, in Yemen. And I have to tell you, one of those countries is the one we're sitting in right now. Uh, so I want to go too far down that road, but... So David, you showed a little four-minute piece, and the first sitting head of state since Nuremberg was indicted, Charles Taylor. He had a chance during his pre-sentencing to call you out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to be the greatest badge of honor <laughs> when a former president indicted, convicted at that time, waiting for his sentencing, calls you out. How does that make you feel? Good. <laughs> uh, I remember standing in Savage Waters and a month after I had gotten an Al White, my head of investigations had just roped off Savage Waters, uh, and I'm standing literally in uh, death up to my knees, and I turned to Al and I said, we're going to get these bastards. And we got all of them, to include Charles Taylor. Uh, so yeah, he was a little emotional. and uh, you know, He called me Lieutenant Colonel. I'm, I was a Lieutenant Colonel once upon a time. I wasn't then. I retired after serving my country uh, uh, as a serving officer uh, for a couple decades, and I'm proud of that. I wore this Legion of Merit with great pride. But he was trying to diminish me and, and, and insult me. He didn't. But I remember when I f indicted him, I sealed it so he didn't know. And then when he was in a P-51 
peace conference in, uh, in, uh, in Ghana, I unsealed the indictment in front of the whole world and in front of all his contemporaries to humble him uh, before the world. And he didn't take that well. And he was trundled off back to Liberia. He went up the steps at the peace conference, a president, he left the peace conference and indicted war criminal. And two months later, he was handed over and put in house arrest in Nigeria, waiting for his transport to our tribunal for a just resolution. But he howled at the moon for two months. He was not happy. He called me a, uh, he pulled the race card. Uh, so it wasn't more than just, you know, this mere lieutenant colonel who would do this. Uh, but also, uh, this is white man's justice. If you'll notice, uh, most of the court is white. That's not true, but that's what he was saying. And Tabo Mbeki, much to my surprise, from South Africa got involved, and he started howling from South Africa and barking at the moon. And, and Tabo Mbeki called me a minor bureaucrat. Uh, Charles Taylor called me a redneck racist. Of course, the press picks up on all this, and you're asked at press conferences about this. And so uh, I was at a press conference, and someone raised their hand and said, Mr. Crane, uh, Tabo Mbeki called you a minor bureaucrat. I looked at him for about two seconds. I pounded the podium. I said, I am not a minor bureaucrat. I'm a major bureaucrat. <laughs> so that pricked that issue, and it never became an issue. But, uh, but yeah, we, uh, I mean, it, the important is there's, there's a, there is a good old boys club in Africa. It started to crumble, and then it re-solidified because of some mistakes by the ICC, and now that good old boy club is alive and well uh, throughout Africa, uh, defying the ICC and, and looking the other way as far as atrocities concerned. But those were heady days, and they were running scared. This was the first time that a sitting head of state, in, anywhere but a sitting head of state in Africa, and uh, this was potentially the crack in the wall. Uh, unfortunately, they've spackled it over, but uh, at the time, it looked like the, this was moving in the, in the correct direction. Regardless, as you saw, he was found guilty of aiding and abetting uh, the destruction of over 1.2 million human beings. Now you think, he just got 50 years? There's no hard time. I mean, there's no parole at the international level. There's no time off for good behavior. 50 years is 50 years. He's 60, he was 64 at the time. So if you can do the math, it's, Someone asked me, he said, if, if, he, if he serves his entire sentence, uh, would you object to him being released? I said, he'll be 114 years old, I think, right? <laughs> and I said, let him go. Uh, but that's important for you to understand. He's not leaving Her Majesty's maximum security prison near Barrack upon Tweed. Anybody been to Barrack upon Tweed? It's in the northwest corner of England, just short of the border of Scotland. The sun never shines there. I've been there at all. It is far away from West Africa as you could possibly make it other than the North Pole. It's cold, it's wet, it's rainy, it's gray. And every day he'll get up and he'll look out whatever window they have for him and realize that we, the people of Sierra Leone, won. See, there is a place worse than Jamestown, New York in <laughs> April. Uh, I understand it's this sunny all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, David, your mandate was to prosecute those who bore the greatest responsibility for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other serious violations of international human rights committed during the civil or Sierra Leone Civil War in the 1990s. How difficult was it to pick, what, I think it was 12? Did you 12? 13. 13? How difficult was it? Well, again, this is the first time in history that uh, the mandate of the of, uh, of tribunal was just prosecute those who bore the greatest responsibility. He went back to Nuremberg. You know, they picked 23 out of hundreds of bad dudes. Uh, it's a workable mandate. It's, it, there's, there's a reason. When they gave the mandate to Richard Goldstone at Yugoslavia and Rwanda, uh, it was prosecute those who <coughs> bore responsibility. Well, that's hundreds of thousands of people. No court system in the world can prosecute 100,000 perpetrators. It's just not possible. Uh, and because of it, the Yugoslavian Rwanda tribunals were struggling because they didn't know where to start. They had trouble figuring out who was who and who they should prosecute. Where I was given the mandate to prosecute those who bore the greatest responsibility. 
which means that's maybe uh, two dozen. And it, for the first time in history, I had to make the decision, what does greatest responsibility mean, and who should I indict? And so I chose, there were three warring factions in the Sierra Leone Civil War. There was the Revolutionary United Front, which was the rebels, the Civil Defense Force, which was a quasi-governmental supported organization helping the Sierra Leone Army fight off the rebels, the RUF, and then there's this crazy group of guys that were part of the RUF called the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, uh, and they were headed by uh, an individual. So there were three warring factions. Then there was Charles Taylor, who was in Liberia supporting, aiding, and abetting all of these monsters doing these incredibly horrible things in Sierra Leone. So uh, I broke it down into three warring factions, and then I picked the heads of all of those warring factions, the three individuals, four individuals, who ran these incredibly gruesome organizations. You know, we're talking sacrifice, cannibalism, gutting, maiming, tearing, ripping, pillaging, plundering, burning, maiming, to name a few. Uh, so that was my decision, was is to prosecute the leadership of the warring factions. So it ended up being uh, 13 individuals. A couple of them died on me in prison. One was killed by Charles Taylor, body cut up and thrown into the bush. Uh, but we convicted nine. And uh, I was charged in my indictments. So I signed in March of, of 2003. Uh, so from that, other tribunals will take that as an example of limiting the narrow scope. Now, does that, is that complete justice? No, there's a justice gap. There were about 30,000 perpetrators, most of which were children under the age of 16. You know, the famous child soldiers who destroyed tens of thousands of human beings as children from ages 6 to 18. Monsters, little monsters. I had the opportunity to prosecute them. It was in the statute. I chose not to because I said that no child has the ability to commit an international crime. They are as much victims as the victims. And I can tell you a wonderful story. I met a child soldier uh, in one of my seminars at Utrecht. Uh, but that may be a little bit, I'll tell you now anyway. It's really amazing. I was at, so anyway, I, I chose not to prosecute the child soldiers. Uh, they were a lost generation. Uh, and. I was, teach, I was giving a, a, a seminar at, uh, in, in, Amster, in The Hague, a week-long seminar, a master's class on how to create a tribunal, what are the issues that are faced. And I was giving this talk at the beginning. I had been invited. I wasn't teaching the whole week-long course, but I was teaching how I set up the special court for Sierra Leone. Uh, and during the break, it was a morning session, so uh, during the coffee break around 10.30ish. Uh, this young man came up, a uh, very handsome young black man. Uh, he walks up, Mr. Crane, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm so-and-so, and I want to let you, let you know that I'm a, I just finished my Master's of Law degree at the University of Alabama, and I'm interested. I took this course before I go off and start my career just to kind of get my balance as far as the practicalities of international criminal law. But I want to tell you a story. And he says, in uh, November of 2002, four months after I'd been there, I had a town hall program. So I traveled the countryside listening to my client, the people of Sierra Leone. In Kabbalah, I w went up to speak to a whole group of boys, former child soldiers who were now in first grade, from the, and they were all in the ages of 15, 16, and 17. They didn't go to school. They just murdered, raped, and maimed their whole life, and now they're going back to school. And they were all sitting out in a, a field. And I was talking to them on a, a megaphone, uh, talking to them. And there were UN peacekeepers all around. And I pull up in an armored car and my close protection officers and stuff. And I walked up to them, and they're just shrunk back. And I welcomed them in a very calm voice, told them why I was here, that I want to listen to them. Uh, I want to bring justice not only to the vic your your victims, but also to you. And they began to cry. It's the first time in their life they've been shown mercy. 
and they thought I had come to arrest all of them, not talk to them. And so we went through our town hall meeting, and I went off. But anyway, uh, fast forward from 2002 to 2016, I believe, not 15. In July of 2016, this young man is standing in front of me, and he goes, I was in the field in Kabbalah in 2002. I was a child soldier, and you allowed me to move on with my life. Now he is an attorney, graduate of the University of Alabama, an American, and it just, boy, it just struck you that, you know, you don't really, when you drop a pebble in the water, you really don't understand where that ripple is going to be. But here's one of those ripples coming to me saying, thank you, you saved my life. David, as we wind, wind this, this part up, uh, this saw the sentencing, Charles Taylor, 50 years, that sort of ended the uh, Sierra Leone, special court for Sierra Leone. Uh, what's its legacy today? It's now ended, it's over, it's done, it's just some of the ancillary work. Uh, what's its legacy? Well, again, uh, uh, the special court for Sierra Leone was the last major tribunal to start and it was the first to finish. Uh, very efficient, very uh, effective. Uh, it brought justice. It brought all those individuals who bore the greatest responsibility to justice. They're all serving their time uh, in various jails around the world. The UN doesn't have a jail system, so countries have to agree to take them. That's why Taylor is in the United Kingdom, because they agreed to take him for the rest of his life. Uh, the legacy of the court uh, is that the UN and a region or a country can join together to create a tribunal. So, and they created the world's first hybrid international war crimes tribunal. Uh, that's a plus because of the faltering of the ICC. Nations are looking around to what's a good justice mechanism for Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, South Sudan, to name a few. And the special court is looked to as the, the example of some, you know, a, a future tribunal. So that's, that's important. Great jurisprudence, important jurisprudence, such as a head of state who, a sitting head of state who commits international crimes while he is head of state is not immune f due to head of state immunity for those crimes. That was prosecutor me versus Charles Taylor. It's a, to a couple in here to include our, our honored judge here, that's like a Marbury versus Madison kind of decision. Forever now, no head of state can hide behind the shield of head of state immunity. So, well, I was head of state. You can't get me because I was, I'm immune. So that, that's a huge step. Another jurisprudential uh, and important aspect of, uh, of this is that uh, those who attack peacekeepers uh, intentionally can be prosecuted in the international law for international crimes, and the special court did that. Another key aspect is, is that anybody who recruits children under the age of 15 into an armed force can be held liable as an international criminal for doing that, destroying those child soldiers. We were the first tribunal to do that, et cetera. Uh, it, it's now known because of its size and its efficiency as the little engine that could. Uh, to give you a, an example, the, University, uh, the, the Yugoslavia tribunal uh, had over a thousand people working in the office of the prosecutor. The entire court itself cost the international community $150 million per year times 20 years. So, and then the Rwanda tribunal was even more costly and even longer. Uh, the special court for Sierra Leone, from stem to stern, appeals, convictions, all of that, lasted about 10 years. The last well, we were largely done by 2010, 2002 to 2010, but Charles Taylor's case took a little longer. It was 2012 before he was trundled off to, to jail. So officially 10 years. Uh, my office, uh, the office of the prosecutor, had 70 people working in it, did the same thing. Uh, why? Well, I just applied good old Management 101, U.S. Management 101. Take the mission, plan the mission, develop a budget, stick to budget, get it done. At the UN, in other words, I designed the office based on the mission as opposed to design the mission around the office. In the UN, they do it backwards. They hire a thousand people, then they decide what they're supposed to do. And so you have a lot of hall walkers, but yet they're getting paid incredible UN salaries. 
So there goes the cost right there. Just personnel alone jacks that thing up millions and millions of dollars. But you know, I've been an ma American manager all my life in, in the federal government managing and leading organizations. So I just, what's my mission? What do I need to accomplish the mission? How much money do I need? And if I'm, I can remember briefing the Security Council on, on this and their, their mouths just hung open. I said, here's what I'm gonna do, here's when I'm gonna do it, here's where I'm gonna be in one year, three years, and five years, and in my estimation, we can be done around six years. And here's how much it'll cost. You do this every day in your businesses and your work. It, it was a no-brainer to me. I thought that's how they did it in the UN. Never been in the UN before. And you know, it's like, stop working so hard, you're making us look bad. It was that kind of attitude. You know, one guy said, I think you're succeeding a little too much. It's a strange world. I, I actually was admonished for succeeding at the UN. It's the only time I've actually been chewed out for doing a good job. But that's another story. I have to read my memoirs. They say a lot about that. <laughs> they'll, <But> be <laughs> they'll be coming out soon also. But at the end of the day, the Special Court for Sierra Leone said that no one's above the law. The rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. And the people of Sierra Leone believe that. And that's good enough for me. He's the founding prosecutor of the Special Tribunal for Sierra Leone. And his work that was done, not only for everything that David said, he was actually nominated in his work at, for, the special, uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize. So ladies and gentlemen, David Crane. Thank you. And for those interested, uh, the, you can actually see what the book looks like. There is a special sheet here that you can uh, order it, and there's a 20% off because you got to listen to David Crane today. That there sounds go. good to me. Thank you, thank everyone, you. for coming. Thank you. thank you, Rotary, for making this a possibility. Appreciate it. Greg, and thank you so much, uh, both of you, for today's sure. program. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Jamestown, we are thrilled that you were here. And it is Rotary's mission to eradicate polio throughout the world, and we are this close to doing that. And in both of your names, we will be making a donation to uh, eradicating polio. So thank well, you Thank again. you very much. I'm honored. Believe me.